Hello and welcome to the weekly commodity market update. I'm Brownfield anchor Will Robinson, joined as always by the University of Missouri's Ben Brown. Hey, Ben. Good afternoon, Will. Hopefully uh, you're having a, a good start, or I guess not start, but good uh, good day so far. I know uh, we got some exciting reports coming up this week, so we're going to preview some of that. But Yeah, no, it's an exciting report. In fact, this could be uh, the biggest report week of the year. Um, I, I tend to treat the March report maybe as the highest or the most anticipated report just because it's our first, you know, kind of estimate of, of new crop supply with perspective uh, planting intentions. And then, of course, in May, we get all the demand, the new crop demand estimates. Uh, but really, this July acreage report this year is, is one of uh, the more, you know, interested reports we've had, just given some of the planting challenges we've had across the country. Yeah. But anyway, before we get to that, uh, let, let's get a snapshot. Uh, where, where do the markets stand right now? Uh, what price adjustments have we seen from last week? I, I'm just so ready to dig into that acreage report. Well, I, I was ready. I was ready to roll. Sorry. Um, okay, so it was a wild week uh, in markets, uh, and certainly I think we're, we're we're seeing markets consolidate prior to those, you know, the stock, the June one stocks report and the acreage report here coming up later. It's also just the end of the month and the end of the trading contract, so we're seeing some big swings. Uh, Commodities were mostly down. Old crop corn for July down twenty three cents to seven dollars and forty four. New crop corn for December down fifty seven cents to six fifty three. Uh, old crop soybeans in July down 51 cents to 1630. New crop soybeans in November down 78 cents to 1432. Uh, looking at those different components, soybean oil again fell another six and a half, almost seven cents per pound uh, to 65 cents. Uh, soybean meal uh, in, fell eight dollars and ninety cents per short ton to 442.7 dollars. And then new crop July wheat, uh, the big loser on the week, down $1.15, all the way down to $9.04. So some big swings there, obviously. What was really uh, rocking the boat? What was causing all that? Yeah, I think you're seeing managed money funds, uh, you know, kind of exit out ahead of the big reports later this week. Uh, they don't like surprises. Uh, there's there's a lot of uncertainty about what acreage could do in the, you know, in the, the June acreage report. Um, on top of that, we got some positive weather, uh, this, or at least weather forecasts for the next couple of weeks that show really favorable uh, growing conditions across the majority of the country, the Midwest, providing some rain in the east, uh, a little bit more rain maybe in the west as well, and, and drying out to get some, some crop growth um, in some places that need some, some drier, drier weather. So I think really, you know, the, the weather forecast coupled with we're, we're kind of consolidating here at the end of the month, uh, really kind of had some, some pretty big price swings last week. All right, I won't hold you back any longer. So we're gonna start diving into this acreage report, uh, getting some some preview numbers, or not preview numbers, but preview thoughts on what you think we might see. So really, how do you think we stack up coming into this report, um, you know, coming out of, of the, the acreage situation that we've seen with some, you know, maybe corn acreage that, that might not have gotten planted up north, maybe adjustments there. So what, what, what are we really expecting here? Yeah, so, in March, producers told USDA that they intended to plant 89.4 or 89.5 million acres of, of corn. Uh, that was down, you know, almost uh, 4 million acres uh, from, you know, the, the final estimate in 2021. Um, and so it, it's like that was a that was a big moment for the corn market, uh, a bigger drop than than many people anticipated. Uh, one of my colleagues and mentors at Ohio State um, we talked in length about it afterwards, and he felt that the, the big story coming out of March was cost, that for the first time in his life that he felt that producers actually were looking at the cost side of the equation when making some of those, those acreage determinants. Probably the biggest thing, the reason I say that is because probably the biggest thing that I think has got people uh, maybe a little bit puzzled as we head into acreage and anticipated, anticipating this report um, is outside of really the eastern Corn Belt uh, and, and maybe even the northern plains, there was pretty good planting conditions uh, to get the crop in, especially in places like western Missouri, Kansas, Nebraska, uh, western Iowa. So did we pick up some more corn acres? And then on top of that, the, the corn price uh, was at least justifying pulling, uh, planting some corn. The, the corn price that was being offered for December was suggesting some of the higher input prices uh, weren't going to, to have as big of a financial hit as what they wanted. Um, so I do think we did pick up some corn acreage. 
Um, my estimate has been somewhere around a half a million uh, acres of corn, primarily maybe in, in um, this Western Corn Belt, Western Iowa, Nebraska, Southern Minnesota. I think we could have, I think we might have picked up some additional corn. The the trade, um, whether they listen to me or not, I doubt that's the case. They're also <laughs> anticipating about a half a million um, additional acres of corn uh, coming into the report on on uh, Thursday. So uh, that's that's kind of the the big question there is that corn and, and soybean number uh, that they've got the total pie of corn and soybeans staying about the same. Uh, the trade is, in expect, is expecting about a half a million acres less on the soybean front. So um, again, switching out some soybean, turning it into corn. Uh, if we look state by state for just a second and think about potentially uh, what that could mean, uh, you know, it's probably those, those, um, those upper plain states of, of North Dakota, uh, Minnesota. So when we look at the planning intentions report, uh, specifically just at the intention of corn versus soybean or corn and soybeans, you know, Minnesota was at 98% of the year before, North Dakota at 93% of the year before, Wisconsin 98% of the year before that. So uh, those could be the states where we see a little bit more corn and soybeans. But I also think they're going to pick up some acres from the wheat market. I don't think the spring wheat market's done enough uh, to retain uh, the acres they had. Well, looking at, at the, the acres dis discussion, it's been a really interesting year, I think, this year, just because there's almost, you know, different factors that are fighting each other. Obviously, there's a lot of value to be captured right now within the market with prices elevated, and that could maybe adjust some decisions. You talked about the input prices and maybe how that's maybe shifting the picture as well. But what are we seeing on the fringe states right now? So states that, you know, we normally wouldn't think about from a lot of production standpoint, you know, because I'm hearing anecdotal stories about maybe a, a push towards soybeans in states like Oklahoma, where, you know, you wouldn't normally think, oh, that's going to be a lot of production out of there. So Oklahoma, the story there is really the drought um, and the dry weather uh, to, to some extent, right? So uh, we've uh, often wondered how much the the short or the the smaller input cost for soybeans would entice people to to take a you know a risk on soybeans versus corn. So if if you've got a condition where input prices are high and you're maybe concerned about producing a crop due to to dry weather, would you would producers favor the the lower input cost crop uh, soybeans grain sorghum stuff like that? I think we've seen that in the past with grain sorghum. The soybean case is interesting this year from the standpoint that. Um, you know, soybeans fare have fared pretty well in Oklahoma, but grain sorghum's really done well, um, especially with some of the grain sorghum prices we've seen over the last couple of years. I'm, I'm maybe a little bit surprised that grain sorghum's not making a bigger play than what it is, and soybeans are, is moving in. Uh, I will, I guess, mention in terms of other, you know, maybe like uh, fringe states, if you will. So we got the crop conditions report this week, uh, and it was largely as expected that uh, states in the eastern Corn Belt, after having such a wet, wet, wet planting season, that the spigot basically turned off and it's becoming very dry. Um, so you look at states like Indiana, Ohio, and Michigan, um, their conditions were down um, this week and kind of drug that whole U.S corn and soybean, good to excellent conditions rating down. In fact, it was across the board. Soybeans, grain, sorghum, cotton, all had good to excellent ratings that were down 3% lower than what they were last week. Well, and at what point do you think that starts becoming more of a factor within the market? I know we've talked about, you know, at what point do weather markets seem to come into play? And it seems like the market's been staving that off. But, you know, when interviewing and talking with farmers, you know, they're saying we're, we're right on that edge to where if we get, you know, a, a couple more consecutive days in the mid 90s with little to no moisture, they're, they're going to start feeling that pressure. So when does it start to factor into the market? About 11.05 on Thursday um, is when it starts to factor into the market. I say that a little tongue in cheek, um, but the, you know, there's a lot, there's actually some truth to that. Uh, so the market is very much um, trading and trying to anticipate and getting their positions in place uh, for the acreage and grain stocks report on Thursday. Um, as soon as that comes out, you know, there is very little evidence that suggests the acreage changes a whole lot um, from the final acreage report to the first from the final acreage from what the June acreage report says. Um, and so the, the market's going to largely take the, the June numbers this week as, as given uh, and 
we don't have the the extremely late planting this year like what we did in 2019 so they're largely going to take those acreage numbers given um the question then becomes okay what about yield that becomes the defining factor on the production side and that's where you start having these bigger conversations about drought um, rain growing conditions uh, as we head into July. So I'm going to say July or July 1st, um, just uh, to give us a little bit more breathing room, but the markets that will start trading weather starting uh, Thursday afternoon. So really just to summarize that, what's kind of going on there is you're eliminating a, a factor of volatility. You know, it's it pretty much not, not set in stone, but like you said, it's pretty well, you know, set at that point, it doesn't adjust much. So then it kind of heightens, you know, all the other effects that are left like weather and, and impacts to yield and, and so on. Yeah. So. yeah, yield will be the driving factor come July. Gotcha. Looking uh, looking forward, you know, uh, are, are there any other things that farmers really need to be paying attention to that could be a, a driving force in the markets this week? Yeah, the one thing that I would probably highlight is, is basis conditions remain um, very strong. Um, Corn, old crop corn and soybean basis uh, kind of weakened uh, a little bit over this last week um, from the prior week, uh, roughly about five to 10 cents. Um, but they still remain at very strong levels, uh, especially in the Western Corn Belt. Um, that signals to me that, that producers are not selling into the cash market, um, that the, the futures price falling uh, the last couple of weeks, and especially the, the big decline that we saw this week in futures positions, um, is kind of eliminating that advantage uh, for end users. Uh, they're, they're not able to rely on that futures market to do their bidding for them. And so they're having to increase those basis bids uh, to really try to work to bring some grain in. Um, I look out to August and I don't see a lot of coverage for end users. Um, so there's probably some end users that do not have the available supply that they need uh, for for uh, later this summer into July into August, um, and they might be in an interesting spot where they have to you know capture uh, or you know bid up prices, especially those like local basis values, just to get grain in. So, you know, we the next month really could be a, a very volatile period uh, for for grain producers. But right now, basis bids are, are strong, um, historically strong, and they're, and they're very strong. So if, if producers are thinking about you know, marketing some grain, but maybe kind of a little bit disappointed in this, this futures prices, or you know, maybe you think, hey, it's dry, uh, and, and we're going to see uh, futures prices rally, you know, taking into account some basis contracts here um, could be a way to capture some of that historically strong basis that we're seeing, especially in the Western Corn Belt. All right. So a lot of information there to absorb. So really uh, looking forward for the rest of the week, uh, reports for farmers to watch. Uh, potentially there will be an ethanol report coming out on Wednesday. That is if uh, USDA is able to get, you know, the cards in order there. We've been uh, lagging on that report specifically for a, a few days now. Uh, then export sales that will be on Thursday along with uh, grain stocks and again that acreage report that we've been previewing. So if there's any uh, other uh, news or information that you listeners would like to, to learn more about, uh, check us out at brownfieldagnews.com. Our counterparts on the livestock side are also found there with uh, Megan Grebner and Scott Brown from the University of Missouri. As always, we're uh, happy you joined us this, uh, this afternoon. I'm Will Robinson on Brownfield.